Amen. Well, this evening we're continuing, uh, well, our uh, look at John's Gospel. We're going to be looking at just two verses, and that will actually take up all of our time, even as the uh, three we were looking at this morning uh, did so. And these verses again follow on that passage where Jesus is asking Peter about his love for him. And after he affirms that love, Jesus gives him the commission to take care of his church, to shepherd them. And then Jesus says this to him regarding the cost that is going to, he's going to incur by following him in verses 18 and 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now, one thing I just want to say at the beginning, I think you, you already understand from the tone of the service that uh, Jesus is not telling Peter, when you were younger, you could dress yourself, but when you get older, somebody else is going to dress you. That's not what he's saying. But basically, you bound your clothes up to yourself. You dress yourself. Yes, when you were younger, you went wherever you wanted to go, but when you get older, you will be bound, and someone is going to take you where you don't want to go. And on this basis, of course, Jesus says, follow me. Now, we do want to see this evening that, that he's not telling Peter to obviously dissuade him from coming, but he's actually telling Peter that there is another honor that is in store for him, and that is the honor of being a martyr. I, I was reminded of this, and we all were in this um, third, actually the second verse of the hymn we just sang, and blessed would be their children's fate if they like them should die for thee. The author of this hymn considered martyrdom a blessing, and we should see it in that light. Now, I just want to remind you again that Jesus, having confirmed uh, that Peter uh, has repented, as evidenced by his confession of love and his humility, remember Peter no longer says, I love you more, Lord, than these love you. Uh, he was quite humbled by his failings, but he still loved the Lord. And Jesus, having restored him, as we saw, to the honor of being an apostle and having commended to him the care of his sheep, he now tells him of another honor that he had reserved for him, and that is of being a martyr. Now, again, we may not think of martyrdom as, as an honor, but it, it actually is. There's no way to avoid the fact that one day we're all going to die. Uh, no matter what we do to try to preserve our lives, our bodies, because of the curse, are going to return to the dust, and our souls are going to return to God. Now, certainly, to give our lives to the Lord in service to Him is an honor that the Lord has given to all of us, and that's how we should be using our lives. But to have it cut short, to seal your testimony... And the work that you have done for His glory with your blood, as Jesus did His, is an even greater honor. That's the way Paul saw it. Uh, writing to Timothy about his forthcoming death, he, he says in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. This was written in his second Roman imprisonment, and he was, in fact, on the eve of being put to death. But he considers that not something to be avoided, but rather something to glory in. Now, this is what Jesus tells Peter, that he has planned for his future. Again, let's read it in that light, verses 18 and 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you 
and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Now notice that Jesus, first of all, begins his statement with the words, truly, truly, I say to you. Whenever the Lord uses the word amen, which is translated here truly, he's telling us that we should pay attention to what follows because what he is about to say is a solemn truth. Now, of course, when he uses it twice, we should pay even closer attention. Of course, even if Jesus doesn't say amen, if he's speaking, we should pay attention. But he uses this to draw our attention specifically to what he's going to say. Now, he wants Peter to pay attention because what he's about to say is not something that will likely take place, but something that will certainly take place. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him, and he's telling him. Jesus not only knew what was going to happen to himself, remember that he was telling the disciples throughout his ministry that he was going to be crucified, he was going to be buried on the third day, he was going to rise again. Jesus also knows what's going to happen to those who belong to him. He knows what's going to happen to us. As a matter of fact, he knows what's going to happen to everyone, but the fact that he knows what's going to happen to us should be of particular interest to us. Now, what he tells Peter, in essence, is this. Peter, I'm appointing you to feed my sheep, but it's not going to be an easy road that it's ahead of you. Not only will men not honor you for this, but you can expect difficulty, you can expect persecution. He told them that earlier, and he tells them here, you can expect to seal your testimony with your own blood. He's basically telling Peter that Peter is not going to die a natural death, but that he would be executed for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the sake of his gospel. Some believe that this reference to the stretching out of his hands was pointing specifically to crucifixion, since this is the way that Jews understand uh, the, these terms, the stretching out of one's hands. Now, church tradition teaches us, and we don't, again, church tradition isn't always reliable, so we don't know for sure, but we don't really have any reason to doubt uh, what it tells us about Peter, that he was, in fact, crucified at Rome while Nero was uh, Caesar around 68 AD, just prior to uh, the war of, uh, of Rome with the Jews or the Jewish wars that Josephus tells us about. Uh, church tradition also tells us that when it was time for his execution, Peter would not allow, well, actually he requested because he really couldn't tell them what to do and what not to do, but he said, please don't crucify me as my Lord was crucified because I'm not worthy to die in the same way that he died. Instead, crucify me upside down. And that, again, is what the tradition tells us that that is the way that Peter actually was, was put to death, that he was crucified upside down. Now, others believe that Jesus isn't specifically talking about crucifixion here, but is simply pointing to the chains and the imprisonment that were awaiting Peter prior to his death, but they still see that death is involved here. And again, what, what, I, what I'm saying here, the way we should read this, this verse, because Jesus here is clearly telling him that this has to do with his death. Uh, in verse 18, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird or will bind you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, it's interesting that of the many who have followed the Lord Jesus Christ and of the many who have been or those who have been most faithful to the Lord, that those who did died a martyr's death. As a matter of fact, church tradition tells us that out of the 12 apostles, and I'll use the, the number 12 in this case, uh, with Paul having replaced Judas, the only one who didn't actually suffer a martyr's death was John. Uh, John's life was spared, um, and as we know, he, um, he was the last uh, apostle who was living. Now, does that mean that the Lord doesn't love His disciples because He puts them through this kind of death? Well, no, it isn't because it is an honor to die 
for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was actually giving to them a blessing, and we need to make sure we understand that that is what it is. It's not only a blessing to die for the Lord, it is a blessing to suffer uh, that which is meant for Him, to suffer in His place. Now, Jesus says Peter would suffer, but Jesus wasn't meaning to say that He would only suffer at the end of His life just before He would be put to death. He didn't actually have to wait very long before the sufferings began, the sufferings that Jesus was preparing His disciples for throughout His ministry. Peter suffered quite a bit. He was arrested along with John when, remember, they healed the lame man at the temple and this huge crowd of people gathered around them and they began to preach the gospel to them. Luke writes in Acts 4, verses 1 through 3, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. As you know, they were also placed on trial, threatened, and then released. Peter was shortly after that arrested with the rest of the apostles when the Lord began doing even greater things to them, which was drawing even more attention uh, in Acts 5, verses 14 through 18. And all the more believers in the Lord... Multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. But the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. So the second time Peter was arrested, and then finally he was arrested and imprisoned, not finally, but at least in this, in this series of examples. He was arrested and imprisoned when Herod inaugurated his persecution against the church. Luke writes in Acts 12, verses 1 through 3, now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword, a martyr. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. So here's the third time Peter gets bound and put into prison. And as also, as we know, the third time he is released. There were sufferings ahead for Peter in the path of obedience, as there will be sufferings for each one of us who will do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, there isn't suffering if we take our light and put it under a bushel, if people don't know that we're Christians, if we never actually reach out and try to talk to other people. The persecutions come when you open your mouth and you begin to talk, when your light begins to shine. The Lord tells us if we're willing to do that, then we are going to be persecuted. Now, notice next that Jesus tells Peter that he would be bound and carried where he did not want to go. Does this mean that, that when the time came, Peter was going to resist uh, this honor of becoming a martyr? Well, I don't think Jesus is telling Peter that he wouldn't consider that an honor, the honor and the blessing that Jesus actually intends for it to be but that like the rest of us, he wouldn't necessarily enjoy being imprisoned and then executed. Remember our Lord, when he was faced with the death that he knew he came into the world to face, the one by which in laying down his life, he would set his people free. He didn't necessarily enjoy the prospect of having to suffer on that cross either, but he prayed that if it was possible, this cup might pass from him. We can still have the desire to preserve our lives, even while we're still willing to submit to the Lord's will and to give up our lives in His cause. Uh, none of us necessarily want to die, and we don't have a death wish, we don't enjoy pain. Death, we know, is unnatural, the separation of the soul from the body. We haven't experienced it. It's a mystery to us in many ways, except we do know that our soul will go to be with the Lord, but we don't know what it's like to exist as a 
as a soul without a body. Death is the result of the curse. But that, of course, is what makes giving up our lives so much more honoring to the Lord because we're willing to endure that for Him. We're willing to give up something that is precious to us, our lives, in order that we might glorify Him. But again, that's what every believer will do, not necessarily caring about with themselves a death wish, but that if the Lord should call us to do it, that we would be willing to lay down our lives for Him. Now, the sacrifice the Lord would call Peter to make becomes clearer when he compares what things would be like then compared to what they were now. He says in verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But of course, when you get older, things will be different. Now, Jesus here is drawing a contrast between, again, what things were like for him now versus what they were going to be like for him then, that things were going to change. Now, we've already seen that Peter had to endure persecution uh, several different times, but still, when he reached the end, things were going to become more difficult. Now, enjoying the Lord's blessings can sometimes make the difficult times that we have to face even more difficult. I think you understand that. Uh, sickness is harder when you've enjoyed a life of health. Uh, old age, as we know, brings with it certain liabilities and certain weaknesses, the inability to do things we were able to do before. When we've enjoyed youth, old age becomes more difficult. Poverty is something that is difficult to manage when you're used to enjoying prosperity. And imprisonment, of course, is difficult when you've enjoyed freedom. Uh, again, when we go through difficult times, remembering what the good times were like can make the sufferings more difficult. And we actually see that uh, in a couple of examples here. Job, the man who knew about sufferings, when he was undergoing sufferings, was desiring the things would be like they were before. He says in Job 29, verses 2 and 3, Oh, that I were as in months gone by, as in the days when God watched over me when His lamp shone over my head, and by His light I walked through darkness." Uh, he was in darkness without that light. It seemed as though the Lord had turned against him. And Job desires those, the, the things would be like they were before when he was enjoying that clear light of God's countenance and blessing in his life. The psalmist writes in Psalm 42, verses 3 and 4, "'My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. It's very natural when we go through difficult times to remember the times of blessing. And sometimes when we remember those blessings, it makes the difficult times more difficult. But there is a way that we can look at the blessings uh, that we're enjoying now during the good times so that, when we, uh, so that we actually can continue to see them and see them as blessings that the Lord intends them to be even after they're gone. And I think we need to see the blessings that we have now in this light so that when we do face adversity, uh, it won't be as difficult. The first thing is to realize that the blessings that the Lord gives to us that we really never deserve them in the first place. You know, that, that's something that really can be comforting to us when we go through difficult times because God is so gracious. The good times tend to be the norm. And we think when we begin to suffer that we really don't deserve the suffering, but we need to understand that it's really the suffering that we deserve and it's not the good times. The good times come purely by His grace. The sufferings are what we deserve, really. And even, of course, when all the blessings are gone and we are in the middle of the suffering, we still are getting something more than we deserve. Now, I am talking about what we deserve versus what Jesus deserves because God doesn't give us really what we deserve. That's His mercy and His grace. If we got what we deserved, then we would, of course, be in hell. 
So even in the worst of times when we're suffering in this life, we're still having more than we deserve. We didn't deserve those blessings. Those are purely by His grace, and we should be thankful for them. And we should realize that what we're actually undergoing, we deserve that and far worse, but God hasn't given to that to us, so we should still be thankful. And I do believe that that's how Job viewed his circumstances or his, his situation. Even after everything had been taken away from him, his possessions were stolen, his slaves seemed to be the only ones that survived this, this ordeal, all of his children were killed, and even his health was taken away. And after everything had been taken away from him and his wife, in her bitterness, comes and encourages him, Job, just curse God and die. That's, that's what I think you should do. He says to her in Job 2 verse 10, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Job put things in, in, his, in a proper perspective. We should also remember that even when God does send adversity, even though it may very well be what we deserve, God is not punishing us and He's not really giving us what we deserve, even though we do deserve it, but He means the adversity for our good. He brought these things into Job's life for His good. He was, of course, appointing Peter what he was going to have to go through for his good. It was a blessing. Everything that God sends into our lives, He means it for our good. He has promised to work it together for our good, as we're reminded in Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. Well, what good does He work out of it? Well, He teaches us to trust Him. He teaches us to love Him. He teaches us to be more thankful for the blessings when we do have them. He uses those things to help us to grow. Now, we do need to remember this because Jesus clearly tells us that if we follow Him, this is what we must expect. We have to expect difficulty. We need to know that that difficulty, God has promised to work together for our good. He said to His disciples in Mark 10, verses 29 through 30, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. We need to understand that those persecutions are there, but we do need to understand that when the Lord brings them, he does bring them for our good. Uh, the, the path is a hard path, but as we see, there are also many blessings to comfort us along the way, not the least of which the end of the road is eternal life. Now, um, the fact that Peter is going to be a martyr is not the only thing that Jesus says to him. There's also something which is implied in what he says, not, well, not just implied, but stated, and that is that even though he's going to have to face this at the end of the road, and even though there's going to be difficulties along the way, he was still going to live to an old age in spite of those difficulties. Again, look at verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Jesus is not only predicting His death, but He is also making a promise to Him here that He is going to live to an old age, that He was going to protect Him for many more years. Uh, if church tradition is correct, and Peter was actually martyred under Nero in 68, Jesus is essentially promising Him here another 38 years of life during which the church would enjoy His ministry. But when old age came, he was going to be ushered out of the world a bit more quickly at the hands of his enemies, but in doing so, he was going to be honored, and of course, he was going to enjoy the blessings of heaven. As we read in that psalm, you know, the Lord sets us securely on high, and sometimes in order to do that, he takes us out of this world and brings us to Mount Zion, to heaven. 
The Lord tells us in his word that a gray head is a crown of glory and that it is found in the way of righteousness. We are more likely to live a long life if we love the Lord and live according to his will, which is what Peter was going to do. There are exceptions to that, of course, but generally that is the case. But remember, we all must eventually die. The author to the Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for men to die once. Now, it's equally true that the Lord has determined how each of us will die. And it's not just that we will die, but also the way in which we will die. We all came into the world in one way, that is, we were all born into it. But we are all going to leave the world by different paths. The way we leave isn't as important as how we leave. Now, this, this is something that's a little bit different than what we've been looking at. It is an honor to be martyred. That is a way in which we're going to leave. But we're all going to leave. And the way we leave isn't as important as how we leave. And what I mean by this is simply this, that we want to use our death as we have used our lives for the glory of God. Our duty from the Lord, which, of course, as you know by now, for Christians, for us, is a labor of love because the Lord has bound us to Himself by His dying love on the cross. It is our duty not only to use the time He has given to us in this world to live well, but we are also called upon by the Lord to die well. We are not only to glorify Him with our lives, but we are also to glorify Him in our death. Matthew Henry had a very helpful quote, which I'm assuming will be put up for you to follow along. He says, when we die patiently, submitting to the will of God, die cheerfully, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God, and die usefully, witnessing to the truth and goodness of religion, of course, he means the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and encouraging others, we glorify God in dying. And this is the earnest expectation and hope of all good Christians, as it was Paul's, Philippians 1.20, that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, we may not all be called to die the death of a martyr, but we all are appointed to die and the way in which we die isn't as important as that we glorify God in our death. So let's be encouraged to use the time God has given to us to give Him glory. And when it comes time for us to leave, to try to die in the way that Matthew Henry has encouraged us to do, submitting to the will of God, rejoicing in hope, witnessing to the truth and goodness of religion, and encouraging others not to die in fear, but rather to die in faith. I think... Uh, one of the things that has been most encouraging to the saints over the years is to see certain deathbed experiences when those people who died were still lucid and they died in faith. Some of them actually, uh, it appears, were given a glimpse of what was coming. And uh, in, in Puritan days, I don't know that we do that so much today, but in Puritan days they would, they would almost attend their beds hoping to catch just a glimpse of what they were seeing, to listen to what they were saying as they expressed the things that they saw, which they believe to be things that the Lord was showing them as He was coming to take them home. Well, that can be very encouraging. But again, the point of our text this evening is this. The most honorable way to die in God's kingdom is the death of a martyr, is to have our life cut short for Jesus' sake, uh, to give up our lives for His glory and for His cause, even as He gave up His life for, for ours, for, for our well-being. Jesus says in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Well, who is our greatest friend? The Lord Jesus, who gave His life for us. Now, why is it um, an expression of greater love? Why is it an honor to 
die the death of a martyr, why is that something that we should not avoid but rather desire? I mean, not throw ourselves into the lion's mouth, but not be afraid that this might happen to us because if it does, it would be an honor. Well, there's at least three reasons. First of all, because it demonstrates more powerfully than anything else that we believe the truth if we are willing to lay our lives down for it. Remember, um, the seed of the church is the blood of the martyrs. The martyrs sealed, when they sealed their, their testimony with their blood, it, it gave the greatest witness that the world could have of the truth of what they believed. There could be no greater sacrifice that they could make to confirm their testimony. And secondly, because in doing so, God's grace is magnified. When people see martyrs, people who are willing patiently to commit their souls to Him in their sufferings, it's a tremendous encouragement to those of us who remain when we see people giving their lives for the gospel of Christ. It's one of the reasons why we do the Reformation series and we look at church history I'm not sure that any of the ones we're looking at this time around died a martyr's death. We did see many of them in the time of the pre-Reformation as they were going against the grain, as it were, of the church. The church was the one that was putting them to death, uh, at least, you know, the, the churches that had become uh, in those days. But it is an encouragement to us when we see that kind of commitment, when we see a Tyndale lay down his life, or a Cranmer, you know, as he's being burned at the stake, put his his hand into the fire, which signed his, remember his recantation of the, of the gospel, but then repenting, uh, repented of his recantation. And church history tells us that he, as the flames were engulfing him, he put out his hand and let his hand burn up, the one that signed that document first before he sealed his testimony, the testimony of the gospel with his own life. That can be a great encouragement. And then thirdly, because this level of sacrifice is precious in God's eyes. The psalmist writes in Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His godly ones. And when His saints, as I've said before, give up what is most precious to them for His glory, the Lord will honor that sacrifice. So it is an honor to... Uh, to be able to lay down your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the greatest sacrifice of the greatest love. It is an expression of the greatest love that we can show to the Lord to lay down our lives uh, for Him. Now, the last thing I want us to see is simply the command that Jesus gave to Peter after telling him how He would glorify Him in His death. He simply says, follow me. Now, this was a further confirmation to Peter that he had been restored to the Lord's favor and to his apostleship because this is how the Lord called him the first time. Remember when he was walking out by the Sea of Galilee, he saw the fishermen and he said to them, follow me. Well, now Jesus says again to Peter, having been restored as we saw this morning and now telling him how he's going to die, follow me. Now, this was not only a command for, for Peter to, again, begin this work that Jesus just called him to, but it was also to show Peter the path that he was to travel, the way in which he would experience what it is that Jesus had just told him. Essentially, what he's saying, as you follow me, you are going to be treated the way that I have been treated. They hated me. They, they put me to death. You're going to be hated and you also are going to be put to death. Jesus told them this same thing earlier in John 15, verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you? A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So follow me, Peter. This is the way in which this, what I've just told you, that's going to come to pass will come to pass. Jesus also said, follow me, to show Peter how it was to do that, how he was supposed to do this work in the way that Jesus had done this work. Remember, Jesus was training them over the last three and a half years for this very reason. Peter had followed Jesus' example while he was on the earth, and now he was to follow his example and his teachings after he departed to heaven. 
And really, what greater example could Peter have than Jesus' own personal example? And we should add to this, what greater promise could Peter have had than the one Jesus gave to him in the Great Commission, that he would be with him as he went out to give him success and to watch over him, to protect him, and to eventually bring him to heaven. Remember, the Great Commission incorporates all of us. We are all called by that commission of our Lord Jesus to do the work of the kingdom of heaven, which has to do with sharing the gospel. This is what our Lord also calls us to do, which is follow Him. Now, our path is different than the one that Peter was called to, and the way in which we leave the world will likely be different, but our example is the same. Jesus is our example of how He wants us to live. And the promise that He has given us is the same. The Lord will also be with us to give us success. He will watch over us to give us safety. And He will eventually bring us to heaven if we simply trust Him and follow Him. So even if it means that we have to lay down our lives, remember, it is a blessing to do so. There is nothing that should get in our way. Jesus has made every provision. Let's not be afraid, but let's believe. Let's trust Him and let's follow Him. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord.